In this video, we discuss learning outcome number three, which is about using frequency distributions to infer properties of data. So one thing that we might be interested in is whether data come from a normal distribution or have a normal distribution. Now, a normal distribution um, has that bell shape um, that you've probably seen many times before outside of statistics. It starts low, then it's high, and then it's low again, and it has symmetry. Um, so we will be able to see if our data set has that shape just by looking at that frequency distribution. If you see that low, high, low pattern in the numbers themselves in your frequency distribution table. So if the numbers start low and then they go to um, a high frequency, a couple of high frequencies, and then they return to low numbers um, at, as you go through the classes in your frequency distribution, the data might have a normal distribution. Um, and that distribution would also have to be approximately symmetric. So it should be roughly a mirror image. If, as you look at the frequencies that are below that, that high point, and you look at the frequencies um, that are above that high point, they should be um, roughly the same. They don't have to be identical, but they should be roughly the same if the data have a normal distribution. So let's look at an example. This is our frequency distribution for the eruption times for Old Faithful. The question is, does the data appear to have a normal distribution? The first thing to ask yourself is, does this have that low, high, low pattern that we're looking for? Well, it starts at one, and then we don't see any data um, for a couple of the classes. And then it goes to three, and then suddenly it's high, and then it goes down a little bit. Um, but there is no low, high, low pattern. It's sort of very low at the beginning, and then it's suddenly high toward the end, and then it never really decreases to the same uh, frequency on the other side. Um, so we don't see the low, high, low pattern. So this is not, we wouldn't expect this data to come from a normal distribution. Um, and we're also um, not seeing the symmetry. Even if we think of this 34 as this frequency of 34 is representing sort of the center of our data set. And we'll talk more about measures of center in chapter three. Um, but if we think of this, these 34 eruption times that were between 225 and 249 seconds as, as being like, you know, where the majority of the eruption times tend to lie. If you look just to the, to the class below that and the class above that, there are, three eruptions that were in the class below that and 12 in the class above it. So it doesn't have that symmetry that we're looking for, even if we were thinking of 34 as sort of our measure of the middle, which we'll talk about more in chapter three. So we don't have the symmetry. We don't see the low, high, low pattern. So we would say that this duration time data for eruption times of Old, old Faithful does not appear to have a normal distribution. So that's one thing that a frequency distribution can tell you. Let's look at another example. These are penny weights. The table shown is a frequency distribution um, for the weights in grams of sel randomly selected pennies. And so you have all of these uh, weights over here on the left, ranges of weights, and then the frequency of pennies in the sample that had those weights. So we had 18 pennies that had a weight between 2.4 and 2.49 grams. And there were 19 pennies that had a weight between 2.5 and 2.59 grams. And then there were no pennies that had weights in these ranges or in these classes. And then later we had some pennies with these um, higher weights between 2.9 and 2.99, between three and 3.09 grams and so on. Does this tell you anything? What do you notice? Well, I hope you notice that there's a big gap. There's a gap between the pennies that are, are relatively light and the pennies that are relatively heavy. Um, that may indicate something about your data. So gaps may indicate that the data come from more than one population. Now, if there's no gap, that does not necessarily mean that your data did not come from more than one population. If you had um, two populations, of just coins, let's say, if you were looking at weights of pennies and weights of, um, I don't know, nickels or something like that, if there was any overlap in their distributions, you might not be able to tell 
um, that some of those weights were weights of, of nickels and some of those weights were weights of pennies, um, or some of those weights were weights of pennies and some of those were weights of other types of coins um, because of the overlap. Um, but if there is a gap, that may indicate that there's more than one population there. And that happens to be true with regard to our pennies. Um, so here are some facts. Pennies made before 1983 were 95% copper and 5% zinc. And then after 1983, they made them with 2.5% copper and 97.5% zinc. So the weight differences between copper and zinc um, mean that the pennies that were made before 1983 generally weigh a different amount than pennies made after 1983. So that's what we're seeing when we see that big gap in our frequency distribution. Now here we've got a comparison. We've got drive-through service times and we've got times in seconds in each of our classes over here. And we have drive-through lunch service times in seconds for both McDonald's and Dunkin, Donut, Dunkin, Dunkin Donuts, excuse me. I'm gonna ask you the same question again. What do you see? Now, I hope you said that these Dunkin Donuts service times tend to be lower. Notice that 44%, we're looking at a relative frequency distribution this time, or actually two embedded or side-by-side -side relative frequency distributions. 44% um, of Dunkin, Dun um, Dunkin Donuts, excuse me, service times are between 75 and 124 seconds. And 48% of McDonald's service times are in that next class. Notice that sort of the high point for the McDonald's service times is at that 125 to 174 seconds. And the high point for the Dunkin' Donuts times um, is that 75 to 124 seconds. So if you have relative frequency distributions, um, that's one way uh, for similar data sets, of course. Um, you might be able to compare two different populations um, just by looking at these tables side by side. So we see that Dunkin' Donuts service times tend to be lower than those at McDonald's. Now, just to uh, be fair, um, it makes a lot of sense. Dunkin' Donuts is just picking out a donut and giving it to someone. Generally, they don't have to cook anything. Um, so it would make a lot of sense that you would have to spend more time waiting at McDonald's because they're making you food. As opposed to at Dunkin', they probably made those donuts very, very early in the morning. They're maybe just you know, grabbing a coffee for you or grabbing some milk to go with your donuts. Um, so you're gonna have a different experience there. Um, so we can use relative frequency distributions to compare similar data sets. And now we've got another one. And my, I think my face is covering up the question, the question that I keep asking you. It says, do you notice anything here? Okay, so these are pulse rates in beats per minute for females. This actually came from an older edition of the Essentials of Statistics textbook. And this is just actually a subset of the entire data set, but I think what they used this subset in order to create this table over here. So we've got a um, frequency distribution, but we're taking, what we're, we've done is we haven't um, grouped pulse rates by classes. We haven't said we've got this many pulse rates in this range and this many pulse rates in this range and this many pulse rates in pulse rates in this range, which we absolutely could do if we wanted to. And I believe that they, I believe we actually did that in the older edition of the Triola textbook. Instead of looking at it that way, they said, let's just look at the last digit of those pulse rates. So anytime you give me a number, the last digit is going to be some number between zero and nine. So it's going to be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then and if you, you know, you go, go up uh, in the tens unit, you'd go back to zero again. Um, so the last digit would be one of these. Notice the frequencies. The last digit was zero nine times. And there was, there were no um, pulse rates that had last digit, a last digit, excuse me, of one. And then we have a frequency of eight. So there were eight pulse rates that had a last digit of two there were six pulse rates that had a last digit of four. What do you notice in this table? 
Do you notice that it's nine, zero, eight, zero, six, zero, seven, zero? Half the time it's zero. And when is it zero? It's zero. The frequency is zero when the last digit is a one or a three or a five or a seven or a nine. What might that tell you about the data set? Well, I hope you notice that there are only even numbers. And this suggests that if we're talking about pulse rates in beats per minute, rather than someone sitting there and counting the number of beats in 60 seconds, what may have happened instead was that someone was counting the number of beats in 30 seconds and then doubling it. And if you look at these numbers, it turns out that they're actually all multiples of four. So they didn't even, they didn't even um, uh, measure the pulse rate for 30 seconds and double it. They actually measured the pulse rate for 15 seconds and then multiplied it by four to get a pulse rate um, for a number of beats per minute, um, probably just to save some folks some time. Um, so the numbers themselves actually tell you something about the way that data was collected, so that can be insightful. So this frequency distribution of last digits tells you something about the data and the way it was collected. So just as a summary, if you have a frequency distribution and you see that low, high, low pattern in that symmetry, um, that indicates that the data might be normally distributed. So just having this table, which was relatively easy to construct, will allow you to determine if the data um, comes from a normally distributed data set or the data itself are normally distributed. It's having that bell-shaped distribution that we'll talk more about um, later this semester. Um, also, if you have a frequency distribution and that has gaps in it, that might indicate that you've got more than one population represented in that frequency distribution. Now, if there are no gaps, that doesn't tell you anything. And you might have a number of data sets, or excuse me, a number of populations that are being accounted for, or you may not. Um, but if there is a gap, that might tell you something. If you have frequency distributions for um, similar data sets like the McDonald's and Dunkin Donuts uh, drive through time data. Dri uh, frequency distributions will allow you to compare them. And lastly, looking at the numbers themselves or looking at frequency distributions related to the digits and the numbers themselves. It may, the numbers themselves may indicate something about the way the data was collected. So frequency distributions are relatively easy to construct and they tell you a lot about the data. Now let's look at that pulse rate data just one more time. Just to emphasize this. We've got pulse rates and beats per minute for females at the very bottom of this screen. You might say, okay, well, I guess I could kind of average them. If I looked at them, I could see, I see a lot in the 60s, I see a lot in the 70s, you know. You, you could kind of get a sense of what's going on by looking at this, this list of numbers. But gosh, there's a lot going on there. You have a, a, when you have this huge list of numbers or a table in Excel or a couple of columns in Excel, it doesn't tell you very much. But as soon as we start summarizing, as soon as we start constructing frequency distributions, those frequency distributions can tell us something about the data. They can tell us something about pulse rates for females if we were to create a frequency distribution for those pulse rates or like this data. These relative frequency distributions can tell us something about service times um, in the drive through at McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts around lunchtime. So this is much, much more meaningful. Um, it's much easier to make sense of because we've summarized it and we've put it in a table than all of those lists of numbers that we started with would be. So I hope now you can see the benefit of frequency distributions. They allow us to determine whether a data, a data is approximately normal. Um, gaps might indicate the presence of more than one population. We could use them to compare data sets, and sometimes the numbers themselves will tell us about the way the data was collected.